sister through the groves of a nearby park in the early morning, bundled in sweaters and gloves, the puffs of my breath looming into fog as I tried to catch up. I was too young to realize the destruction that the freeze brought to the orange crop, the cornerstone of my city. But I understood that orange trees during a freeze are beautiful. The ice covered each leaf. It reached down from the branches in thick icicles to meet the hard, clay-filled dirt. It preserved oranges that would never ripen. I could talk a lot about how to prevent ice from forming on oranges. I could talk about smudge pots, which no one uses anymore, but still populate most backyards in my neighborhood. I could talk about the fans that become pointless after it falls below a certain temperature. And I could talk about how, counterintuitively, you can even spray the oranges with water. How when the water freezes on the orange, it releases just a little bit of thermal energy that keeps the orange warm for a little while longer. I could talk about this, but it'd probably be boring, so I won't. None of these methods worked, of course. Redlands lost its crop of oranges because it was just too cold. But when I walked through the orderly rows of those beautiful trees, I believed that the orange groves would be preserved like that forever. I wanted them to be. I don't remember any birds singing or fans whirring, though there probably were, but I do remember that how the tragic beauty of those frozen trees had reduced me to awe-stricken silence. I'm someone who appreciates the quiet. It has a time and a place, of course, but it paves the way for precious times of reflection. Like Edgar Lee Masters writes in his poem, called Silence, I have known the silence of the stars and of the sea, and the silence of the city when it pauses, and the silence of a man and a maid, and the silence for which music alone finds the word, and the silence of the woods before the winds of spring begin, and the silence of the sick when their eyes roam about the room. And I ask, for the depths of what use is language? Sometimes we need silence, so we create it. Sometimes you just have to lie down on your floor and look up at the ceiling when the world around you is buzzing and busy to feel yourself stretch out and relax. It's like when you'd play hide and seek as a kid. You'd hold your breath in that perfect hiding spot, awkwardly positioned but not daring to move an inch. And in that moment, it's just you. You're left alone with yourself, and it's as wonderful as it is terrifying. We also find silence. We sit on a bench and people watch, or bird watch. We find silence in music or poetry or art. We clean our rooms. We take that moment and wrap it around us like a safety blanket, using it to escape the noises running rampant in our heads. Of course, you can't live your life in perpetual meditation. In a video called Life Rhythm, YouTuber Zay Frank breaks life down into a pattern and discusses finding a balance of what he calls expectation, silence, and surprise. He says, to me the expectation piece is the regularities. It's the habits, the traditions, the job, the things that keep you grounded. Silence is the ability to live between the beats, to be quiet, to be still. And the surprise is trying new things, becoming uncomfortable when you break some patterns. And the craft is the mastery of all three. If you see me around, you probably know I'm only really qualified to talk about the silence part. <laughs> the expectation and the surprise especially come harder to me. I get impatient with the expectations, the things like work and school and small talk. But as lazy as I am, I can't break out of it with any surprises. With silence, though, you don't have to worry about fitting into or breaking expectations. Comfortable silence between friends, the reverent silence in a museum, it feels precious once you have it. However, it can be as harmful as it can be terrifying and soothing. In the quote that Kat read from Catcher in the Rye, the narrator Holden Caulfield remembers going to the museum when he was a kid and talks about how he finds comfort in the way that everything there stays the same. He says, the only thing that would be different would be you. Not that you'd be so much older or anything. It wouldn't be that exactly. You'd just be different, that's all. You'd have an overcoat on this time. 
Or the kid that was your partner in line last time, they got scarlet fever and you'd have a new partner. Or you'd have a substitute taking the class instead of Ms. Adelfinger. <coughs> or you'd heard your father and mother having a terrific fight in the bathroom. Or you'd just pass by one of those puddles in the street with gasoline rainbows in them. I mean, you'd be different in some way. I can't explain what I mean. And even if I could, I'm not sure I'd feel like it. Throughout the novel, Holden wanders around New York City, desperately trying to make a connection with people, but ending up with a bunch of failed conversations. He remembers the museum because it represents a simpler time for him. For him. Before his brother died, and before he got repeatedly kicked out of boarding school, and before he realized how full of phonies the world really was. But part of the reason that Holden feels this disconnect is because he's stuck in the museum. He wants to keep his childhood innocence, and he tries to do that by going back to that preserved place. The Holden Caulfield who's telling the story, however, is able to engage with us because he has moved away from that place. We can't force silence and reflection on ourselves forever. Honestly, I like silence so much because it feels safe. If I could, I'd lie down with my back against my fluffy carpet and stare at the ceiling forever. But I'm learning that the moment has to pass, and the ice has to melt off of the dead fruit. Even though, like Holden, we have every reason to be terrified, it's worth stepping out of a world frozen in place. It's only meant to be a refuge for a little while. At some point, we have to break the silence with surprise, find a comfort in expectations, and face the future that lies outside of that moment of reflection. As Cecil, the narrator of the podcast, Welcome to Night Vale, once said, Sleep heavily and know that I am here with you now. The past is gone and cannot harm you anymore. And while the future is fast coming for you, it always flinches first and settles in as the gentle present. This now, this us, we can cope with that. We can do this together, you and I, drowsily but comfortably. Ice will kill your orange tree. But for a little while, if you can find one, it's nice to walk in a frozen world and catch that moment of silence.